afternoon, everyone. It's uh, two o'clock. Welcome to the members planning committee. The uh, kind of first before we start, don't forget that the um, item four was Shannon Farm. We all know the applicant there, so uh, I shall be putting in a personal uh, interest in in that application. So anyway, the first item on the agenda then is. Uh, Apologies for absence. I know we've had one. Yeah, from Councillor Linda Tyler Lloyd so far, Chairman. Yeah. Any others? No. Item two is disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests. Are there any? I will be, as I say, declaring item four. Yeah, personal yeah. interest. Yeah, personal interest for me as well. Obviously, all of us, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, I don't know her, so I don't, you know. Yes, I know, she, I know from. I leave it to you, Chair. It's, him. I, it's him. Andrew Stevens. Oh, it's Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The last one. <laughs> I the thought last there was. It was real on Devro. No, that's that's the previous one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. It. Personal. Personal interest as well, then. Personal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Make sure that you. Check out. Yeah. 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 I just Sorry. wanted to say personal interest in that one as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah thank, you. thank you. Yeah. I think we all are. Yes, yeah, it is recommended. Yeah, you take that that you will be declared that interest. No others? No? No other right up? Okay, thank you. Can I, can I ask, Chair? Yeah. yeah? Claim the personal interest. Will a form be coming out to sign officially on that or not? Yeah, yeah. I'll be emailing it after the committee finishes now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then we move on to item three. It's the uh, to approve and sign the minutes of the previous meetings as a correct record, starting at page one. That's the meeting on the first of October. Then the meeting on the sixth of October on page two. Page three and page four. Sunday, move them as a true record, please. Yes, move, Chair. Thank you. And then item four, then. Are there any items for withdrawal or deferral? No, Chair. None. Thank you. So we move on to item five is the determination of planning applications under the Town and Country Planning Act. And that uh, the first one we have before us is. First item is on page eight, and that's up at Jockey Street. And uh, Liam, that's yourself, isn't it? Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you. So this planning application is uh, reported to planning committee as it's a major development. It relates to a scheme for new high-rise purpose-built student accommodation building. Uh, with 328 bedrooms. It includes associated car parking, uh, access and infrastructure works. It has been reported at previous planning committees. You will have seen it on the agenda previously, but uh, withdrawn prior to the meetings uh, to allow us to explore the issue of highway safety. So now the application is reported to committee um, having addressed the issue essentially. So in terms of the site itself, um, it's located on the northern side of the city centre, in an area with a mix of uses. The university's business campus is to the south, the railway line to the east. You've got a residential block there to the west, and a Friendship House and a dance school to the north. So the site is accessed by John Street and Jockey Street. So you can see, see the cursor there coming off Prince of Wales uh, Road. Uh, terminating, it, terminating at the elevated railway bridge uh, further down. So then there is a pedestrian access. It can be obtained uh, from Jockey Street uh, down under the bridge onto Newcut Road to the east. And then you've got, the, as I said, the railway station to the west. <clears throat> so in terms of past history, uh, members may recall um, the site has been subject to a previous application, terminated at planning committee, and it was subsequently refused and it, it was dismissed on appeal going back to February 2019. Now, the former application sought permission for, it was also a purpose-built student accommodation building that ranged uh, between six and 14 stories in terms of accommodation, uh, proposing 414 bedrooms. Uh, so, so some members may recall parking space was limited on that scheme um, to only four parking spaces. 
the scheme then was refused on design grounds. Uh, so members were concerned with the, the visual impact of, um, you recall, a big tower um, being proposed uh, in that scheme and refused on parking um, in terms of creating pressure on the surrounding streets, harming highway safety. So he went to appeal. Uh, the appeal inspector concluded and agreed with the council that it was harmful to the character of the area. Uh, and also agreed um, that there would be a potential risk to highway safety given the severe lack of parking. Uh, the inspector felt that the 14 storey block uh, would have, which would, had a width of 31.5 metres, uh, had a considerable span and height, uh, didn't represent a slender and elegant approach to design and, recommend, and represented a significant bulk and uh, monolithic slab like uh, structure. It was considered to be imposing and dominating within the townscape and wider views, uh, found to be overly intrusive. And then on the issue of highway safety, whilst accepting the site was in a sustainable location and had the potential to reduce demand for car use, the inspector felt that uh, the four spaces that were being proposed uh, fell particularly short of what was necessary really for uh, staff, maintenance, personnel and those sorts of visits to the building. Um, in, in effect, the SPG suggested a requirement for 58 spaces, so it, it did fall quite quite short of that figure. So in terms of planning uh, considerations before you today, um, you'll note in the report um, that we've accepted the principle of development, and that was something um, accepted by the inspector in the last uh, appeal, albeit we do have uh, policies which are set out in your report now um, and uh, an SPG to follow. Um, in terms of the key considerations um, which we can present today, they relate to visual impact. Again, um, how does it relate to the character of the area and the impact on highway safety? Uh, essentially, we need to consider uh, whether the scheme has overcome those reasons for refusal in the last uh, uh, appeal decision. So um, I'll hand you over now to Steve Smith. We'll uh, take you through the design. Um, and then I can come back then to, to look at the highway safety issues and um, how we've come to our recommendation on that front. So thank you, Chair. I'll pass you over to Steve. Then. Okay. Thank you, Liam. Okay, um, thank you, Liam. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm not controlling the slide, so I'll have to just ask whoever's moving on when, you know, when the right time comes. Um, yeah, this slide here is just an overview of the city taken um, from Google, um, looking approximately from the east, just explaining a bit more about the context of this site, which is outlined in red, as you can see on the screen there. You can see the relationship to the train station, the other taller buildings in the immediate context, the, the business school, as you heard from Liam, um, some various housing blocks and designated heritage assets. You've got the Palace Theatre, um, as well as Bethesda, what was the former Bethesda Chapel. Now it's, um, I think, NSPCC offices there to the to immediate north of the site. Um, and generally, this just shows the location of the site as part of the um, overall Upper High Street, um, which it, you know, we know this site especially has or does attract issues of antisocial behaviour. So that's the sort of um, context of the site. Um, and the main thing to recognise through this whole presentation is this site, this proposal before us today, has potential to help regenerate the area as a key catalyst to bring positive footfall, natural surveillance um, and um, fill what is just an empty, vacant piece of land for the, at the time being. So next slide, please. This is the immediate context. Again, all these images are taken um, from Google um, on John Street. Um, so to the left, you've got the three story Friendship House. The site is just beyond um, Friendship House there. On the right are some four storey, slightly elevated um, residential properties that front onto High Street. And at the far end, the sort of grey silver building is um, University of Wales Trinity St David's um, Business School, which is approximately six storeys high. This was historically a grid area of very small terraced housing and the streets have remained but obviously the area has been significantly redeveloped in the past um next slide please so this is moving further sort of south along jockey street turning the bend so it's further south on john street sorry turning the bend onto jockey street on the left is the site which was the site of the former canaldra youth center the building of which has now been um, demolished and the site you know has been enclosed with hoardings um this is so looking down jockey street um, at the very far end, you can just see the arch of the railway there, which goes un underneath down to, um, well, goes underneath the, the path goes underneath the railway down to Newcott Road, um, and the business school there on the right. Um, next slide, please. 
so this is sort of at the bottom of Jockey Street with your back to the arch <coughs> looking up sort of westwards uh, business school on the left site to application site is on the right residential um, properties at the far head and you can just start to pick up the roof of the palace theater in this view um, just poking above there you go thank you and also the Bethesda chapel on the right and sitting in front of the Bethesda chapel at the low level is the you can just see the roof of the DeMarco's dance school there which is a single story building um, running alongside and what you and also obviously friendship out so that's it, it's a it's a mixed context mixed use Uses, buildings of varying character and quality, but definitely a site that is um, re quite ready for regeneration. Um, ne next slide, please. So this is the context of the site shown um, in yellow. It's the yellow sort of rectangle there on your screen within the council's adopted supplementary planning guidance for tall buildings, um, which would have been before planning committee a number of years ago to be adopted. Um, so the site sits within what's called a consider zone for tall buildings, which is an area where tall buildings um, have the potential um, to have a positive impact subject to the appropriate testing and supporting information. And you can see the site sits there towards the north edge of this um, consider zone close to the train station. A kind of, there's an existing cluster of tall buildings in that area. And as you know, if you've recently been into Swansea, um, you would have seen that the um, Mariner Street Tower is you know, certainly a dramatic addition to the city skyline as we hoped it would be which is part of the visual context of this site which isn't highlighted here but it's roughly in front of you there you go that's the site of the mariner street tower that's going up um, as we're talking there thank you um next slide please so this is the proposed site plan with the buildings around that i pointed out earlier teabring glass is the um University of Trinity, Trinity St David's Business School there. So, um, and the site is the reason why there's a sort of diagonal line across the um, site there is because it's a split level site. It slopes down almost a story height, um, drop, dropping down Jockey Street. But what this shows you is the, the is the general approach to the building footprint. Um, it's a sort of an odd shaped site. Um, the building roughly follows the edges of the site, but is set back to create areas of public realm. It shows you the building entrance at the west end of the site there. There's visuals to uh, bring this to life more further on, but and the, the main student entrance is at the west end. All of the building creates what we call active frontages, lots of bedroom windows, lots of shared kitchen, living room windows, and the ground floor is active uses in terms of the communal spaces shared by the students and a commercial unit. It also shows the area on the north side um, up to where the, it, the, there's the building called referred to as club, which is the dance school of the additional parking which has been in, uh, increased in the amended scheme. It also shows amenity space and, and going back to Jockey Street, it shows a new turning head that's proposed that currently doesn't exist to allow for safe um, servicing and access within the development. Um, next slide, please. So this is the kind of upper ground floor level. Um, which shows onto jo um, John Street, sorry. It gives you a better idea of where the student entrance is and the slightly darker um, um, colour there is a small commercial unit. Um, there you go, thank you for highlighting that. So that's a small independent potential commercial unit that provides activity for students, students and wider residents. Um, and so next slide, please. This is a typical floor plan. We're not going to show you every floor plan working up through the building, but typical floor plan showing it's a standard arrangement of a central corridor. Bedrooms and spaces arranged off of that. Um, it's a mixture of studio flats, um, which are kind of self-contained, and what are called cluster flats, which are four to eight bedrooms um, sharing a lounge and kitchen area. Um, and it's mainly the latter. It's mainly a development of um, those cluster flats. Next slide, please. This is starting to get into the upper floors of the building. And the, uh, um, the main thing to note here is the main tower is at the eastern end of the site. Um, closest to the train station. Next slide, please. Sorry, is your screen? Oh, it's gone now. Um, this plan here, obviously Swansea has a strong agenda of green infrastructure as well as the national requirement for SUDS, sustainable urban drainage. And this is a kind of a roof level view of the development. 
showing that all the flat roofs are green roofs and there's also um, communal terraces at high level for the students um, the occupants to enjoy as well as photo the blue squares are photovoltaic panels um, to generate electricity from um, sunlight and there's also back down to ground level there's some drainage features called a rain garden which is a sunken area that's planted up to hold back the rainwater coming off these roofs so this is much more the kind of thing we're going to see on these projects now is these these buildings bringing something back to the city in terms of biodiversity and actually managing the rainwater the surface water next slide please so this is now the um, the flat two-dimensional drawing of the south elevation which is the uh, elevation onto Jockey Street. Um, and what this just shows is how the massing is broken down. You've got on the left hand side, you've got a block, a, a sort of slightly larger block there that demarks the entrance. You've got a general urban scale of um, six stories. And then you've got the main mass on the right hand side there, which is the eastern side, which steps up, which is a very different design um, to the scheme that was before planning committee a number of years ago and the one that was refused. So they've in this in this um, amended scheme, they've reduced the number of bedrooms from 414 down to 328, um, which has allowed the scheme to have the massing significantly reduced and the massing to be amended so that it's much more stepping forms. Um, the general materials approach is two colours of brick, probably a red brick, probably a buff brick, but obviously we don't have that level of detail um, for you today. That would typically be conditioned if approved, um, but it's it's not a rendered scheme. And in, in order to be um, to meet the requirements for fire regulations, that's why brickwork is a very um, common material now. So next slide, please. This is now the the west elevation onto John Street. Um, so you've got Friendship House on the left there in the very light grey, which is the existing building, three storeys. And then the sort of immediate building adjoining that steps up to four storeys. And then you've got the greater mass um, behind, uh, yeah, behind rising up. And on the right hand side of the screen, as context, you've got the larger building of the Trinity St David Business School. So it's a, it shows how the building fits in to the scale and character. Um, of the area and also this is a view facing across to the existing residents and there's a sufficient separation there and the massing is set back to ensure that this additional scale because it is a large tall building is not overbearing on those existing residents. Um, next slide please. So this is a 3D computer bird's eye model of the massing looking approximately from the um, from the west it's almost like you're hovering above high street Looking at the scheme, you can see the block there that steps up in scale in red adjacent to Friendship House. The entrance block alongside that, which is about seven stories or so, and then the larger, taller 13 or so story tower um, at the far sort of the furthest part of the site in this view um, alongside the railway station, rail train lines stepping up there. So see, and you can start to see the two different types of brick being denoted here by the kind of ready brown brick and then a lighter colored buff brick and a very kind of rigorous approach to the architectural elevations using brickwork framing openings. Um, so a very kind of robust um, and elegant approach to the elevations. Next slide, please. So there's a series of eye level views next I'm going to show you and then lastly towards the end of the presentation are some um, verified views um, from the wider cityscape. So these are the kind of close up views. This is the view from John Street with your back effectively to the existing um, residential properties. The grey building with no windows at all is the outline of Friendship House there at the moment. So this shows you how the red brick building proposed steps up slightly from Friendship House and then the larger buildings um, are set around the corner. And this is a slightly artificial view because this is kind of off the footpath here, but shows you the general initial um, linking into the urban scale of the adjacent building. Um, next slide, please. So this is kind of on the corner between um, John Street and Jockey Street with your um, kind of back to where the car parking areas are to the um, Trinity St David Business School. So not necessarily a public vantage point, but it does start to show the sort of scale of the building turning the corner. This is the entrance corner. So this is where the um, 328 students who would be living in this proposed development would come and go every day um, from this entrance area with extensive glazing and columns highlighting that this kind of is the focal part of the development and the lower part of the left building the red brick building is also the kind of potentially the small commercial unit there so a small cafe unit perhaps and above that you can start to see all those windows above are all the bedroom windows and the shared kitchen lounge windows and then you've got the further massing as you go down the hill to, um, to, towards the arches on jockey street next slide please 
So this, again, is a view kind of from within the car park of Trinity St. David, but it gives you a view of the sort of scale as you kind of get towards the eastern end of the site. You've got the red red brick linking block, which is six storeys, and then the stepping up of the tower adjacent to the railway line. Um, next slide, please. This is a closer view of that linking block, and those trees in the middle there are in that section of, of, of green infrastructure that I described as a rain garden. So it's not necessarily a piece to sit on, but it's an area that would deal with the surface water coming off the building before it goes back into the network. It provides a very important buffer and greening onto um, Jockey Street. It also would be part of a secure perimeter to the building. So the building provides extensive levels of natural surveillance of the public realm, and we know that there's antisocial behaviour occurring in this area, and it also makes sure is secure for the students that will be resident here. Next slide, please. This is the view, as you can see, kind of through the arch, looking from almost with your back to um, Newcut Road, looking up Jockey Street um, as you kind of um, approach the development. With uh, as you just as you come further up, there'll be lots of windows overlooking this, lots of natural surveillance, and an enhanced public realm, which we'll come back to at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is the view from the north, kind of effectively, if you were standing by um, Bethesda Chapel. Um, so this this starts to show the effects on the designated heritage asset, um, which is considered to be acceptable as part of an urban cityscape. And I should say that there's um there's no negative effects on any designated heritage assets, including the Palace Theatre. Ultimately, this development will generate a huge amount of footfall potentially, um, which will help with the wider aspirations along High Street. As you know, the council is progressing with the Palace project as a co-working hub, desire to get further businesses in the upper part of the High Street, and all these students passing those businesses will help to sustain um, and um, encourage business diversification. Um, next slide, please. So um, high level view. Um, yeah, high, high level view, just looking down onto the roofscape here, um, just showing the various different green roofs, the um, shared terraces for the students. Um, as, and so that's that's what I'll say on that one. Next one, please. OK, so the next sequence of um, slides I'm going to show you is a series of verified views, uh, which are part of um, any tall building. We require the, um, the visual um, effect on the cityscape and on the skyline is tested in a, as I say, in a verified way that we know we can um, rely on as accurate. So this first slide on the screen here simply shows the, uh, you know, it shows a couple of examples of the change of massing from the refused scheme, which was refused for being monolithic, was refused for being slab-like, and was refused because it was not slender and elegant. Um, and they were the concerns of the planning committee, and that was the, they were also the concerns of the planning inspector. Um, so that's the red line there. The purple lines is, is the kind of massing of the current proposal. So obviously it doesn't show any architectural detail. It doesn't show the brickwork, but it just shows the basic shapes of what are now proposed. And what you can see here is the height is significantly reduced with that reduction from 414 down to 328 bedrooms. So the, the overall height is reduced and it, that's allowed the form to be varied, to be more stepped. Um, obviously, bearing in mind that we've got Mariner Street as the kind of primary dominant tower in this area, and this was always envisaged to be a secondary tower in this location. Um, and there are two key views, one's from Morva Road, the other one um, is from Newcut Road, looking up past the existing um, St. David student development. Um, next slide, please. So there's a series of views now which are kind of comparing and contrasting the refused and dismissed scheme and the current proposal. So this first one slide that you've got on the screen now is the scheme that has been refused in the past. And this is taken, as you can see, from the, the ramp to the Devati footbridge. Um, so if you can click to the next slide. So that's you can see the transition there. So this is now the current scheme. So whilst it's still clearly a tall building and it's within the consider zone for tall buildings set out in the SPG, the height is reduced and the massing is more articulated. Obviously, it's not bright blue in colour. Um, it will be the colours of brickwork, as I described before, a red brick on the lower buildings and a kind of buff light brick on the taller buildings. So it, 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 it's still prominent, but it's not... Um, is not jarring. So, so they're the two con compare and contrast of <coughs> refused and amended. Um, the next slide, please. So this is the view from Windmill Terrace, which is one of the kind of terraces overlooking the roofscapes on the, on the city. Um, 
so we just get an idea of how it fits into the overall skyline and cityscape so the current this current slide is what was refused and dismissed next slide please this is the amended scheme so it's still a tall building but much more stepped and um, less dominant on the skyline so there you go compare contrast between the two so get smaller and get more articulated and stepped um, still still a tall building um, next slide please so this is the view from Newcut Road looking um, approximately north. You, you, you can orientate yourself there. You've got the kind of new student developments and David's development there on the right hand side. So you've already got some existing tall buildings in this in this immediate part of the city. So this image on the screen at the moment is the scheme that was um, um, refused and dismissed. Next slide, please. That's the amended scheme there. So as I said, still a tall building, more stepped down, um, and obviously the, 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 the brickwork materials will um, be less, less jarring than the colours used here. These are just kind of the way that the colours are used to be able to um, assess the massing. Um, next slide, please. So again, elevated high level view from Berwick Terrace, um, looking over the roofscape towards Kilvey Hill. What this doesn't show is the Mariner Street Tower, which would also be visible in, the, in this view, um, which will be, you know, is, is, is taller than the Old Way House development there towards the right hand side of the view. So currently there you've got in the light blue highlighted the um, refused and dismissed scheme there. So very, very monolithic. It was considered to be very slab like. Um, next slide, please. So that's the amended scheme, which is again lower step down, step back, using the different materials to make it seem broken up, um, to make it to make the amended scheme appear slender and elegant as a positive addition to the cityscape. So the, 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 these these exercises can be quite abstract, um, but what it does definitely demonstrate is that the amended scheme has a reduced scale and it has an improved design, um, and the use of materials make it less um, jarring in the cityscape as a, as a more considered and positive addition. Um, next slide, please. So this is the um, final slide from me before I hand back to Liam. So it's just gone back to that overall um, massing view, um, just showing how, just reminding us how the building is um, grouped and articulated. So uh, just just thinking back to the um, inspectors concerns and the planning committee concerns um, the, the, in terms of the amended scheme, the officer assessment is now that yes, it is now slender and elegant. The redesign has made this large building. Um, it is a high density um, tall building, but it, it is now slender and elegant. It is not monolithic or slab like anymore. Um, clearly, it is an imposing feature in terms of um, townscape and skyline, and, and, it, and it's considered to be an imposing feature in a positive way a positive addition to the city um, and both positive in terms of that wider view and in the close-up um, experiences on Jockey Street and John Street with again the thing to maybe note here is something else to mention is the public realm enhancement so it's not just seeking to leave the scheme as you know narrow footways and tarmac it's to create a pedestrian orientated environment around the base of the building so what we have before you um, is a building that creates a strong marker for the train station with a 13 storey stepped tower to the rear of the view here. Um, a good urban scale of the linking blocks and a seven storey kind of entrance building there, which is the one nearest to the view there. So that positive addition to the city. Um, and really importantly, it is considered to be a very key component of helping to regenerate the upper, the upper high street um, with positive activity and footfall, natural surveillance, that, that ensures that antisocial antisocial behaviour is controlled, and for all those reasons, it is um, supported in place making terms. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Liam. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Steve. Um, I think it's useful there to to see that well, the slide that's on the screen because it shows how how it's been broken up in in uh, in mass in really from the last scheme. Um, what I'll come on to now is just the highway safety issue that was obviously. Uh, discussed previously on the last scheme and um, articulated in the appeal decision. So, so as mentioned, the last scheme it had only four parking spaces to serve the whole development of 414 bedrooms. This revised scheme uh, proposes 328 bedrooms, but the parking provision is 18 parking spaces. So those would be located uh, within the development site, um, along with space to store 164 bicycles. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I believe we've got the um, um, yeah. So we've got the that just shows the the site area. I mean, the park is central within the site. So if you if you know from John Street, um, you've got the area marked out with visibility displays. Um, so that's the entrance into the parking area, which 
just referred to. So in terms of the SPG for city centre site uh, within the core area, there would be a need to provide one parking space for every 25 bedrooms, uh, that being for servicing, wardens, drop off. Um, and for this amended scheme, uh, that would be 13 car parking spaces. But the site actually lies outside of the city centre core. So if it was in the city centre core, it would the 18 parking spaces would comply with the SPG. Um, but as it's outside of the city centre core, even though it, as we've said, is very close to the railway station, very sustainable site, um, the SPG reflects a need for one space per 10 bedrooms. So that brings the figure up to a need for 33 parking spaces in addition to the uh, 13. So that results in a need for 46 spaces. So as we set out in the report, um, we fully acknowledge there is a shortfall in parking. Um, when compared to the SPG requirements. But um, as we've said, the, the site is within a highly sustainable location. Mm. So a short walk from the railway station, bus route um, facilities, uh, city centre in walkable distance. And as, as Steve touched upon, really, it, it allows the opportunity to support uh, sustainable transport and really that shift in mode of transport as well uh, to support those um, regeneration aspirations of the council as a whole. So um, we've looked at this uh, provision of a Section 106 agreement, um, which the applicants agreed to enter into uh, to secure the control of the car parking management at the site, uh, which is something we're doing on, on, a lot, on all of these uh, sort of student development schemes, um, but as well as a highway and public realm infrastructure contribution of £142,000. Uh, that would fund highway network improvements, um, and, and those are set out in your report on page 45, um, we've, we've touched upon what could possibly be included in, in, in terms of that money um, to improve uh, the cycle route around the Strand, footways on the second tower crossing, um, crossings um, on the junction with Park Tower, uh, changing those to Toucan type, uh, as well as improved footway connections. Um, that's in, essentially in addition to those uh, public realm improvements that are on John Street as well and Jockey Street. So creating that um, active space um, that would uh, almost look to help uh, deal with issues in terms of antisocial behaviour, having that uh, presence there on the site. So uh, highway officers, they previously expressed concerns uh, relating to the movement of vehicle traffic within John Street and Jockey Street. So that's where cars are coming into John Street. Um, it, it's that that area there um, in terms of visibility as well for cars coming out to the site. So the applicant went through a stage one road safety audit. Um, so they tweaked the design there of the external work. So as you can see, as I said, the visibility displays and the areas where the, the, the safe safe areas for cars to to pull off John Street, as well as um, you know it's got the turning area there at the, the bottom of the site. Um, so, so what is demonstrated, um, the car park uh, access or visibility on, on uh, John Street is acceptable um, and there's sufficient scope within Jockey Street to allow refuse and delivery vehicles to turn around uh, and leave the site. So uh, further improvements, they include, um, as I mentioned, the um, pedestrian environment really at that part of the site and enhanced CCTV and lighting uh, in the underpass between Jockey Street and Newcut Road. So taking all the proposed changes uh, that have been made into account um, with the reduction in the extent of bedroom spaces from the last scheme, the increase in parking provision at the site, uh, the provision of a range of planning conditions to control things like the general on-site arrangements in terms of maintenance and parking management, the improvements to accessibility and infrastructure, the wider benefits to regeneration, as Steve has mentioned on High Street and this part of the city, um, along with the, the fact it will help contribute to tackle and social behaviour in this particular area with that ground floor and, and active frontage. All that, um, despite you know, the parking uh, not, not complying with the SPG, uh, we feel that um, it run, the balance runs in favour of approval of the application. Um, and accordingly, it complies with uh, your LDP policies, which are set out in your report. Uh, the place making emphasis and uh, that set out in the SCARF document that uh, seeks to, to really uh, promote the area for living, working um, and learning essentially. So um, I'll hand you back to the chair and thank you. Okay. Thank you very much both. And, um...
Matthew, is your Matthew Gray is the agent for the scheme and can yes. Yeah. Like now with your five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank committee on behalf of the applicant for the opportunity to address you today in relation to the application proposing purpose-built student accommodation at Jockey Street, Swansea. I hope members are well during this difficult period and would like to thank officers for their hard work in support of the project during the COVID period. They've been a credit to the authority. The application before committee proposes the construction of 328 bedrooms purpose-built student accommodation with associated parking, access and infrastructure works. Extensive pre and post submission consultation has been held with officers at the council who have recommended the application for approval. Following the previous application at the site, which was refused, the applicant has worked tirelessly with the professional officers at the council in order to prepare the scheme before members today. Significant alterations have been made to it in comparison to the appeal scheme. These include, but are not limited to, a significant reduction in the overall height of the proposed development. The scheme will now be smaller than projects currently under development in the immediate vicinity. An overall reduction in the number of student bedrooms by 86 units. An increase in car parking provision by 10 spaces in comparison to the previous scheme, in addition to the reduction in the number of units proposed. A package of improvements, a new cut road underpass, which will enhance the environment and safety of users. The measures include additional LED lighting on walkways and additional CCTV cameras to provide increased surveillance of the surrounding area. Historic reasons for refusal for the development of the site for the purposes of student accommodation centred on scale and massing in addition to highways matters. Members would have noted in the committee report that the comments from both the design officer and the highways department are now supportive of the scheme. The previous appeal decision acknowledged that the site is in a, a suitable and sustainable location for student accommodation. It's within walking distance of Swansea Railway Station and the range of services within the city centre. A significant proportional increase in car parking is proposed in addition to a student tenancy agreement to limit the use of private vehicles by occupants in addition to a management plan for traffic at the start and end of terms. In respect of design, scale and massing, the officer's report notes that the reduction in the number of units proposed allows for the massing to be reduced to create a lower eastern tower stepping from six to 12 storeys. The amended proposal has been negotiated to a level that meets the requirement of the adopted tall building strategy, SBG, and the Swansea Central Area Regeneration Framework. The development will create a new city landmark at a gateway location in close proximity to the train station. The council's design officer has commented that the architecture is a quality approach with a stepped and elegant tower and that the proposal will help tackle the issues of antisocial behaviour through active frontages and positive footfall. The application site and surrounding area is one which has drawn negative attention in, in the press at both a local and national level. It is a well-known area suffering from indiscriminate drug use and prostitution on a daily basis. The applicant has attempted to secure the site on numerous occasions over the past few years, only for consistent break-ins and damage in a repetitive nature. The proposed scheme will play a significant role in the overall regeneration of the high street and surrounding area. The site has stood vacant for a significant period and is one which detracts from the area within which it's situated. It's contributed to a tarnishing of the city's image, image via negative reporting at a national level and the above mentioned social issues. The scheme will also enhance natural surveillance in the area. Indeed, following direct consultation with South Wales Police, the, the response to the PAC report, which, which acted as a forerunner to the application, noted that officers were pleased with the intention to upgrade the security on the Jockey Street Tunnel with CCTV and lighting. The comments from the, from the Designing Act Crime Officer noted that this work is badly needed to improve the area. In conclusion, as members will be aware, Section 38 of the Town and Country Planning Act requires decisions to be made in accordance with the development plan unless other material considerations dictate. The principle of the proposed development has been established via the recent appeal decision, which acknowledges the suitability of the site for the purposes of student accommodation. The applicant has worked together with officers to ensure that the reasons for refusal linked to the appeal have been overcome, which has resulted in a positive recommendation and support from statutory consultees. 
This scheme has the potential to be transformative in comparison to the current condition of the site. It's supported by the designing out crime officer, local interest groups such as the neighbouring Mencap operation, and has attracted just a singular objection from local residents, a rarity for, su for such a large project. Given there are no other material considerations which negatively outweigh this, on balance, the application accords with planning policy at a local and national level, and it's therefore respectfully requested that members approve the scheme. That's it. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, any hands up? Uh, can, any member wish to speak, ask a question? Uh, Councillor Evans first, yeah? Yeah, just a quickie. Um, in relation to the section, one, section 106 requirements, highway improvements, etc., at what stage of the development will they be uh, carried out? In other words, um, I don't know how long the development would take to complete, but at what stage will the 106 requirements be, be completed? Okay, we'll come get to that. And uh, Councillor Mike Lewis? Ah, yes. Uh, well, this is a far improved application than the previous proposal. And the dismissal of the appeal by the inspector uh, shows that this planning committee made the correct decision last time. Um, this application, in my opinion, is excellent. Uh, I followed the uh, the discussions and and the um, write up about it earlier, and it has everything that we need to promote the regeneration of the Swansea area. Um, and I can only say this application has my support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I got uh, Councillor Des Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thanks, Steve and Liam, for the, again, an excellent presentation. Um, I think the development will certainly enhance the area. Other than that, I don't think it's anything special, nothing to get excited about. In fact, it looks very similar to the current um, student accommodation on the Singleton campus. Those buildings there, it's just, you know, they, they've... It looks like they've been joined together a little bit. Certainly the um, the top floor where you've got that open aspect where you've got, I suppose, the um, the plant which is on, on, on the roof is sort of covered by the by that, that top floor framework. But um, it's a shame that they, they're so boxy looking. It would have been nice if they'd had a shaped roof. But as I say, generally speaking, considering what's there now, uh, this is is a is is a big improvement. Can I ask one further question? Other cities are are the university cities are currently um, changing the use of some of their student accommodation because they can no longer um, find the numbers of students to occupy them. If that were to happen, would it be this building? Would it easily be converted to um, residential use? And even is that something that we should consider even? Yeah, we can, we have uh, dealt with this. I know something previously. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say, um, I welcome the the new proposals. I'd like to thank the officers and uh, the developer for getting back and working hard together. I think it can only enhance the area, so I will be uh, voting to approve this this afternoon. OK, thank you. Uh, no other hands up there? No? No? A couple of queries there then. Uh, yeah, or yes, I can do yeah. you, Chair. I mean, <coughs> I'll, I'll touch on some of them. Um, yeah, the first one from Councillor Des Thomas, um, talking about other cities changing the use. Um, essentially, any change, any change in use would need a further planning application. Uh, but as part of the scheme uh, and our policies, is a requirement to submit uh, what's known as a ad adaptive adaptability statement. Uh, so what the developers done is submitted that statement and looked at um, 
the principle of changing the use if that scenario was to happen. So they document, um, you know, it's not a very substantial document, but it looks at um, could the property be changed to say a hotel use? Um, and it, you know, it, it looks at that or social housing. Um, so in theory it could. Um, so it's it's how that would come through in terms of the detail on a planning application, essentially. So in principle, yes, it could could be changed, um, but it depends on the detail and we need to look at how you know rooms are laid out, etc. Um, and that. Um, so just so that was that one. Um, in terms of the queries about what stage would the section 106 um, contributions come? Um, well, essentially, um, it, it, the timing would be down to us as a planning authority. Um, normally, the payment would be on completion of the uh, 106 uh, contribution to be used by the council accordingly in terms of those works. And we'd need to agree the, the the precise works then in terms of the highway infrastructure works. But then the other clauses of the 106 um, are set out in your report there. Um, they're not all financial uh, contributions, but um, I'll just get the, get those up if you will. <clears throat> yeah, so it's the car parking management, um, controlling on-site tenancy agreements, a clause that the development shall only be um, occupied by registered students, um, and then that, that highway contribution and um, funding the the development. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I got no other hands up. No. Okay. I think nobody else wanted to come back with anything. No. Okay. So you see, then um, the recommendation there on page forty-four is of approval. So we will now. Um, Take, take a yeah, we'll go through alphabetically. Councillor Cyril Anderson. Approve. Councillor Peter Black. Approve. Will Evans. Approve. Mary Jones. Approve. Mike Lewis. Approve. Richard Lewis. Approve. Christine Richards. Approve. Thank you. Okay. Paulette Smith. Approve. There's Thomas. Approve. Mike White. Approve. And yourself, Chairman. Yep, yeah, approve. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Unanimous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and uh, thank you, Mary. Right, and we um, move on to item two there now. It's on page 53 there. It's just Bryn Powder in Clever. And that's. Andrew, sorry. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Um, Ian, if you can just flick on to the uh, section, please. Thank you. Um, this is a section 73 application seeking to vary conditions relating to appearance, landscaping, layout, and scale, approved as part of Reserve Matters Application 2018-1279-RES. So outline planning permission for the development of the site for 70 dwellings was granted in March 2008, and this has subsequently been renewed twice, most recently in 2015. Um, from the outset, it's important to note that the principle of the development is not for deliberation as part of this application, and in addition, neither is access and the internal road layout. The original permission included a section, 106, a section 106 agreement requiring eight of the units to be affordable, a contribution of circa 60,000 towards YGG Gethlionin, which is adjacent to the site, and a highways contribution of circa 120,000. So the application is being reported to the planning committee as it exceeds the development threshold. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Ian. This is an aerial photo of the site from Google. Um, the approved vehicle access would be from Bryn Houthger in the bottom left hand corner of the uh, shot. Thank you. Uh, and you can see that the site has a large tree covering with residential areas to the north and south and YGG getting on into the west. That's the school you can see. Um, you may be able to see a line in the trees, which is a stream and denotes the southern boundary of the application site. Um, there are three pictures on the right. Uh, the top one is Bryn Howithger, the vehicle entrance into the site um, with the northern pedestrian access to Tanakoid Road in the middle and the eastern pedestrian access to Hale of Agur on the bottom. If you can go to the next slide, please, Ian. 
Uh, just for context, this is the previously approved layout. Um, so the reserve matters layout shown on the screen. The development comprised two storey dwellings and the layout included detached, semi-detached and a few terrace properties. So the main difference when we go on to the next slide that you'll see is on the Southern Road Spur, as, as you're looking at this screen anyway, on the bottom Road Spur, Road 3, is that the proposal, uh, current proposal, does not extend as far down as uh, it did previously. So if we can go to the proposed layout, please, Ian. So again, the proposed layout adopts the approved access and internal roads, but there are no terrace properties in the revised layout. The layout again provides for cul-de-sacs off the main access with pedestrian links through to Tana Coid Road at the top and Hale of Vago uh, on the eastern side. Um, the development area has been reduced, leaving more woodland untouched in the eastern area of the site at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and you will note that a landscape buffer is retained along the western boundary of the site between the existing properties and the new dwellings. And note that the site slopes steeply in parts from north to south. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Ian. Uh, this is just, as I said, an example of some of the dwellings. There are various dwelling types and these would be semi-detached properties, but it is worth highlighting uh, that the top one is a, a, a two bed and the bottom is a three bed. Um, and note the windows on the side elevation to ensure an active frontage onto the public domain where these are either overlooking public open space or onto um, roads, etc. So if you can just go to the next slide, please, Ian. This is just a view of the street scene. So O1, you'll see at the top is uh, the new dwellings on the site next to the existing properties on Bryn Houthga. Um, it shows the different dwelling design in the context of a few street scenes through. What you'll note, as I said, this is all the main road, road one. Um, and as it goes further uh, into the site, it extends up. Um, so the middle street scene shows the road going up between road four and two with the local area of play shown as a POS, public open space. So in terms of uh, consultations, we've had 69 letters of objection from neighbours, as stated in the report, relating primarily to the principle of development, impact of traffic and loss of woodland, as well as specific issues that are covered in the report. We've had no objections from highways as access and the internal road layout would remain the same as approved. No objection from placemaking and heritage subject to conditions which have been included uh, relating to the local play area and various boundary treatments. The tree officer has no objections and as I've said previously, the development would impact less on trees within the site than the previously approved scheme. Drainage was originally intended to be considered as part of the application, but following concerns from the drainage officer and uh, Tour Cymru, it has been omitted and these issues would be resolved separately. So we still have conditions on the outline permission that need to be discharged. An application has been submitted um, and as I said, is being considered. So it's just um, been taken out of the remit of this reserve matters application. Just to clarify, the redesign would facilitate Pobble developing the site and providing additional affordable housing over and above that secured. So, as I said, eight units uh, are required as part of the Section 106 agreement to be affordable housing. Um, but as part of this, 48 units for social rented or intermediate housing would be provided. But it's just to clarify that, as I said, this additional provision would not be secured as part of this application because it is just a reserve matters application. So the officer's recommendation is for approval and I'll hand you back in terms of you've got any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, thank you. And um, Mr Baxter, Phil Baxter is with us to um, as the agent. Uh, yes, Th thank you, Chairman and Committee. I represent the applicant's Pobble Group in relation to this application. Uh, this land off Bryn Houthga in Cladach has long, long been earmarked for housing in numerous development plans. And I'm pleased that Pobble are eager to d deliver affordable housing on this site. The site was originally granted outline consent in July um, July 2008, I, th I believe, uh, for residential developments comprising 70 dwellings. Details were also agreed regarding the access arrangements and the road layout, as well as the open space provisions. This consent was subsequently renewed on two separate occasions, and more recently, in 2018, reserve matters consent was granted. The detailed consent for 70 dwellings is therefore, is therefore extant and able to be implemented accordingly. 
Um, the proposal before committee today is to retain the number of units at 70. However, this will be over a smaller, smaller area of land, as has been outlined by our officers, thereby a larger area of woodland would be retained. The access proposals reflect those previously agreed, and the proposals put forward are more conducive to an affordable housing provider um, and comprises a greater number of two and three bed units compared to the previous scheme, which is primarily three and four bed units. As already mentioned, um, the access arrangement was fixed as part of the outline and it's not intended to be changed as part of this application. Um, the approved layout includes an area of retained woodland in the northeastern part of the site and a local area of play and pedestrian links um, to allow for connections to the wider um, community. These are all being retained as part of this development and are an integral part of the scheme. It's appreciate the local residents will have seen many applications over the years to bring this site forward with little construction activity ever commencing. However, I can reassure committee that Pobble have a commitment to deliver the much needed affordable homes immediately. And with grant funding already secured, we're looking to enter into a construction contract as soon as practically possible, um, notwithstanding the current uncertain economic climate. In fact, affordable housing providers are very much bucking the trends. As your officers have outlined very comprehensively uh, in their report, it's not um, considered that the proposals give rise to any material planning issues over and above those previously considered for the application. The applicants have the view that the proposals are a form of development that meets planning policy objectives. And with the benefit of the financial contributions previously signed up to, is consistent with the sustainable development principles and objectives of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. In view of this, um, I'd urge committee to accept the advice of your officers and to approve the application accordingly. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Baxter. Um, one of our one of the local members is uh, present anyway, and Councillor Paulette Smith. Would you like to address the committee? <clears throat> you need to unmute Councillor Smith. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Okay. This is one of the problems when the original application is submitted so many years ago and is still more or less live. A lot of opposition was raised when this came up again. But that was mainly because of people who were concerned about wildlife and access as far as um, roads were concerned, traffic and the amount of um, school, whether we could take a number of children. The drainage was a major problem because there's houses below this site and I'm glad to say it's being addressed. Um, so I can honestly say after looking at this, I am pleased with the new application that's been put in, but I just ask that you must consider the drainage because the water runs straight down to a state just below it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Richard Lewis. Well, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm concerned about, uh, always concerned with an application when they do, when they take away the drainage from the actual committee, from the actual planning. Uh, we've had a couple lately. We've had one actually in Horton. We had one recently uh, in Gowerton, where it was a special, it was uh, um, housing there, social housing there. And the housing, when they put in the application, they put like a, um, a reservoir and they were hoping that the water would run uphill. And the uh, at the front of the, of the development, there was a two meter wall uh, going to be built. And now it's got an eight meters wall. Now, I think that if, if, if any application is going to go through, you want to get it all tied down 
And the fact that you give permission for this and hive off the um, drainage, the two should be linked together because it, on both those applications, which we had, they were separated and it's been a constant and they, they've come back, they've done work afterwards and even uh, hasn't come back to committee. I, I think this is a very dangerous step. I have to say, uh, I know Phil Baxter very well. He used to work for Swansea City Council and the stuff he puts through is excellent. But I think the, the, the only fault I would put in this is in fact drainage. And my view is it should be linked to the planning consent today, not hived off down the road somewhere. That is, and if I was living in the area, in Clitter, I would be very worried and I wouldn't want my house flooded. And these days with all climate change, et cetera, the amount of, of drainage uh, and flooding is going on. We should really be uh, on top of this. I would have thought Swansea City Council should be the, in the forefront of drainage and not uh, send it along afterwards. I, I just think that we are making a, a grave mistake here. And I think the two should be laid. I would be actually voting against this as the one reason the drainage is not in this planning consent. Okay. We'll come back for that. Okay, Councillor Mike White. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a question really to the officers. In the informatives on page 69.3, there is uh, there are obviously still, um, still conditions from seven years ago that haven't been um, by the applicant. Um, have there any been any further progress been made in these these, these documents that, that, that have been requested coming forward? Okay, we'll get you the answer for that, hopefully. Um, anyone else? No other hands up? Oh, William Evans, sorry. Thank you, Will. Yeah, just a late one just come in now. Uh, uh, reference Councillor Lewis's comments, I must say I share them. And, uh, you know, drainage was always an important um, aspect in relation to planning, but I'm un under the impression that there's new legislation on board now yep. that um, whether it's optional for us as an authority to say that it goes separate to planning or in fact be driven down the road that you must be here separately. So I'd like to know what the answer are on that. Okay. Um, Councillor Pellesmith, did you want to speak or because your hand is still up? Yeah, I just like to um, say I am very, very concerned that they're going to do drainage separately because of the amount of flooding that does occur further down because this is at um, the top of a hill, but there is quite a few residential properties below it. So unless, unless you can convince me that the drainage is going to be adequate, I, at this stage, want to be able to support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No other hands I can see. Did you want to come back with anything there, Andrew? Uh, yes, please. Sorry, Chair. Um, just, I was just looking up at the previous consent. Um, just to clarify a few things. In terms of drainage, it's common practice that full drainage details uh, aren't supplied as part of planning applications. There's an inherent cost associated with uh, designing these schemes up. And obviously we have to be mindful that from a planning perspective that the schemes can change right up until the last minute. So uh, often we, we attach conditions with regards to drainage, that's standard practice, and that was what was done as part of the outline uh, application. At that stage, we didn't require the drainage details to be submitted with the reserve matters application. What has happened in this instance is the applicant has submitted drainage details, um, but the drainage details were in relation to the layout as is proposed today, rather than the layout that was previously approved. So the drainage officer has considered them and said that obviously at the moment we can't um, progress those matters until the layout is fixed. So from a planning perspective, there's no reason why we can't uh, approve this reserve matters application, which relates to, as I've said, the reserve matters listed above. 
that doesn't mean that the drainage is going to go away and it's still an issue that has to be addressed. So there is a condition on the outline consent that, um, as I said, that needs to be discharged. We would consult with our drainage officer and we would consult with Dwar Cymru as well before discharging that. And as I said, that, that's pretty standard across most sites. Uh, you'll notice on the strategic sites <clears throat> that have been to committee recently, that's still the approach we adopt. Uh, Councillor Evans was referring to the SAB legislation, which has come in. Again, that has further taken away surface water drainage away from the planning system. However, just to be crystal clear on this, this application is just a Section 73 application for, for reserved matters. Therefore, SAB would not apply to this application. We've had legal advice on this. So, as I said, the drainage issues will be considered as part of the discharge of condition application, uh, which is currently in for consideration. Anyway, thank you. In terms, sorry, one more, just in terms of uh, Councillor White's previous conditions, as I said, the drainage condition has been submitted information to discharge that, but it's just a standard reminder that notwithstanding what members do today, um, and being mindful that there's already a reserve matters um, uh, approval in place for the whole of the site, um, there are still conditions attached to the outline permission that would still have to be discharged. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. That clears that then. Uh, Councillor Des Thomas. You're on mute, Councillor Thomas. No. No. Did you want to speak, Councillor Thomas? No. Okay. Oh, no. Absolutely sure. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, as has been explained, you know, this is a Section 73 application. There is already planning permission. Sorry, on the I've unmute. Oh, sorry, Chair. I've now unmuted. No, sorry. I had trouble unmuting. I've now unmuted. Um, just on that drainage uh, matter, will will the new ap drainage application come back to committee for members' determination? Uh, no, uh, councillor. Um, as I said, we we deal with discharge conditions under delegated powers. Um, so, as I said, this is why you will very rarely, if ever, see a, a discharge condition application at committee. So the concerns of the local member plus other members of the committee will not be taken into account? Well, members' concerns will be taken into account, um, but obviously we will look to the professional officers and, as I said, go to external and internal um, consultees to make sure that the drainage information is that is submitted is acceptable and won't have the impacts that members are concerned of. OK, thank you. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it is the practice. Of, yeah, so no other hands coming up. OK, so as I say, we you know we're dealing with a Section 73 application here, being as the site already has, um, but I'm planning on, on the site. So it's just the details that are before us to vote on now, which uh, we will do now. You see the recommendation that's um, on page 67 is of approval. Yep, yeah, go through alphabetically. Uh, Cyril Anderson. Approve. Peter Black. Approve. Will Evans. Approve. Mary Jones is gone. Mike Lewis. Approve. Richard Lewis. Disapprove, Chairman. Disapprove. Christine Richards. Approve, Chair. Paulette Smith. Approve. Yeah. Des Thomas. Approve. Mike White. Councillor White. Yeah. Oh, it can't be that. And yourself, yeah. Chairman. Yeah, approve. So that's 841 against Chairman. Yeah. So that's approved. That's very well, that is carried. Thank you. And um, next item on our agenda then is item three on page 70, Mansfield Road. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll present this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this application is a householder application uh, proposing extensions uh, to an existing dwelling and uh, a couple of outbuildings. Uh, it's on your agenda today as the applicant is an officer of the local planning authority. 
So proposals include a front dormer extension, rear gable roof extension, a front porch and some other minor elements including re-roofing, uh, alterations to fenestration, uh, extension of the driveway area as well as, um, as I said, a couple of outbuildings, a garden shed and a bike shed. So starting with the site itself, um, as you can see there on the plan on the screen, the red line, uh, the property is in Merton along Mansellfield Road. The street comprising a mix of property types. The property itself is detached with a front gable. So if you move on to the next slide. Uh, so it's got a front gable, uh, as you can see on the top left image there, a side extension with a uh, half hipped roof and um, that contains a dormer. So that was approved in 1986. Um, and then you've got a single story rear extension um, at the back of the property that was approved in 1994. So there's a front bay window, um, as you can see, um, that, and then that spans into uh, to the right hand side. Then you've got a lean to which sort of connects the extension to the main house. So the dwelling itself is slightly raised from the road level. If we move on to the next slide, uh, as you can see there, the dwelling is just set up slightly raised um, from the street level. You've got a small sort of planted bun there at the front and the existing driveway. And then the rear garden, if we go to the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, so that's the other aspect of up the street. There's the rear gardens. You've got um, a patio area there closest to the dwelling. And that's the single story I mentioned at the back. Um, and then the next slide then just shows the, the, the remainder of the garden area. So in terms of the proposals, as I, as I mentioned, um, next slide then, uh, we've got the proposed scheme plans. Uh, the proposal seeks to add a dormer window in the roof space, um, the main house, uh, along with those three roof lights also. So as you as set out in your report, um, you feel the dormer will sit comfortably within the roof space. It is set up from, um, from the eaves, it's set down from the ridge, it is you know, it's within the roof itself. Um, the porch then um, is proposed to be located off the front, uh, as you can see on the front elevation, but then the actual uh, pedestrian access then is on the, the right, top right image. Um, so you'd, you'd access it from um, the driveway area, which would be increased slightly. Uh, a new window would be inserted in the ground floor of the side extension, so you can see on the front, um, the front image, the top left image there. So you've got a window there going in replace of what was previously a fair amount of glaze in there. And then at the rear, um, bottom left image, you've got the introduction of a gable within the roof space. Uh, it results in a very nominal projection um, from the from the main uh, portion of the building. But visually that change, I think we feel you know, it, it responds well with the gable form on the front of the house. Um, wouldn't be able to keep in visually um, nor did uh, impact on the adjoining occupiers. So next slide then, further at the rear, as I said, there's two proposals for outbuildings, um, relatively modest, I and mean, you've got one garden shed there, which is on the, the left there. It goes up to the boundary, um, and then you've got a smaller then bike shed then on the, on the right there, so, so they don't cause any harm visually or, or to neighbours in view of their scale. Um, so if you go to the next slide, just just gives the you know an image showing uh, the top images there showing the garden shed going up to the boundary. I mean it does rise above um, the boundary treatment you can see and it falls back into the garden then so um, and then the bike shed is is very modest. So between all officers feel um, it's acceptable visually there's no harm there um, uh, in terms of the scheme on the street scene or the existing dwelling and uh, it won't raise any harm in terms of neighbouring amenity. Um, so there's been no objections, essentially. Uh, back to you, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you for that. Um, any counting hands to come up no. at the moment? Anyone wish to speak? No? Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> okay, well, if you can see the uh, on page 73 is of approval, so we will take a vote on that now. Yeah. Councillor Cyril Anderson? Approve. Peter Black? Approve. Will Evans? Approve. Mike Lewis? Approve. Richard Lewis? Approve. Christine Richards? Approve. Paulette Smith? Approve. Des Thomas? 
approve. Mike White. No, he's not present. And yourself, Jim. Yeah, approve. That's approved. That's unanimous, Chair. Very well, let's carry it again. Thank you. And then the uh, final item four is <coughs> on page 75, and it's Flannan 5. And that's Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, Flannant Farm, um, so this application has been reported to committee as it's been submitted by Councillor St Stevens. Uh, in terms of background, Flannant Farm is a working dairy farm and beef cattle farm on 175 acres of land and with 180 cattle. Um, it's understood just as background that the original farmhouse dates back to the 18th century. So planning permission was granted in 1988 for a replacement dwelling at Flannant Farm. Uh, a Section 52 agreement, which is effective the predecessor of section 106 was attached to the permission which required the cessation of the use of the existing farmhouse and the attached cottage. So the agreement required these buildings to be demolished or used for agri agricultural purposes only. The replacement dwelling is shown on red on the plan whilst the farmhouse and cottage are shown on the southern side of Planet Road which bisects the farm. Uh, the application seeks to effectively remove the Section 52 tie to allow the use of the original farmhouse and cottage for residential purposes with a TAN 6, so that's Technical Advice Note 6, Rural Enterprise Workers tie and ensure the removal of the caravan from site. So if you can go to the next image, please, Ian. It's just a, an aerial image from Google. Um, it shows the L-shaped bungalow that was the replacement dwelling at the top of the screen, along with a garage and the caravan, which is currently being lived in. Uh, the original farmhouse and barn are located on the southern side of the road with an agricultural building adjoining them on the southern elevation and you can see uh, two other agricultural buildings. So if we can have uh, the next um, slide please Ian. This is the photo of the front of the farmhouse facing northwest. Um, as I said you'll see it's in pretty good condition um, with the agricultural barn on the right hand side of the screen. You can go to the next photo, please, Ian. This is the side elevation of that. Um, so as I said, the, on the right hand side of the front we just saw, this is the, um, as I said, you can see the building at the front and the building at the back. If you go to the next one, please, Ian. So this is a photo of the bungalow. That's the roof you can just see uh, on the left hand side with the garage uh, and the caravan on the right. And finally, the next photo, please, Ian, uh, is a photo of the rear elevation of the cottage. So again, on the left hand side is the agricultural barn. Uh, this is what is known as the, the cottage um, building. So in terms of the appraisal, uh, to start off with, as, as noted in the report, it's unclear why the original permission required the cessation of use of both residential properties for one replacement dwelling, but that's what it did. Um, and it's not considered that a proposal to fit for purpose for agricultural storage and they clearly were not demolished. So we have to look, uh, as I said, as set out in the report, does the proposal still serve a useful planning uh, purpose? From a policy perspective, replacement dwellings in the countryside have historically only been allowed as replacements of the original dwelling to protect the countryside. However, the original permission did not require the demolition of the buildings, but they cannot be used as unrestricted dwellings as they were originally. In this sense, the original agreement does have a purpose. However, the buildings are not fit for purpose for agricultural use, and given the current housing shortage and the fact they're already in situ, their retention as dwelling houses are not considered to impact on the countryside setting. From a sustainability and heritage viewpoint, it's preferable to reuse these buildings in the manner that they were originally intended, and they are clearly intrinsically linked to the farm. Both buildings would be subject to a TAN 6 restriction as set out in the report, limiting both to the use of those um, per rural enterprise worker or as affordable housing, uh, and they would be occupied by the current farmer's sons. In addition, at the, t at the present time, once in, one son lives in the caravan on site, which appears to be lawful, um, and therefore in approving this modification, the Section 106 agreement would also require the cessation of the resident, residential use of the caravan and its removal from site resulting in less visual harm to the countryside. So from a policy perspective, there are significant material considerations weighing in favour of the proposal for the reuse of these buildings for residential purposes subject to a TAN 6 restriction. We have considered whether the proposals, whether these dwellings have been abandoned against the four tests. As can be seen from the photographs, the buildings are in decent condition with few external repairs required. They've been vacant for 20 years, but have only been used for residential storage in that time. 
Uh, and this also lends weight to the owner's intention to retain the buildings for future residential use as they could have been demolished otherwise. So as a from a procedural perspective, it's not possible to revoke a section 52 permission. However, the applicant would need to enter into a new section 106 agreement that effectively stated the agreement would be to not enforce the section 52 agreement and its restrictions. Uh, the new Tan 6 rural enterprise restriction placed on the original farmhouse and the, new, and the cottage and the cessation of the residential use of the caravan and its removal from site upon the residential use of one of those buildings commencing. So the recommendation is for approval to enter into a new section 106 agreement in respect of the above recommendations. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Right, any hands up? Anyone want to speak? No, no, no questions. OK, OK, well, thank you very much. You can see that uh, that's been very well explained there now. And then the recommendation you will see on page 82, uh, which we will now vote on. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Cyril Anderson. Approve. Peter Black. Approve. Will Evans. Approve. Mike Lewis. Approve. Richard Lewis. Approve. Christine Richards. Approve. Paulette Smith. Approve. There's Thomas. Approve. Mike Wright is still not present. And yourself, Chair. Yeah, approve. Approve. That's yeah. unanimous. That's unanimous. And uh, thank you very much. That concludes our business for today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye all.